Good day to you. And if it's like any other day in your life, at least most days, you're going to be buying something today, right? You're going to be buying something. I mean, a quick and easy example of that is your cell phone bill. You're compiling charges every single day, so you're paying for your cell phone. But I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the clothes you're going to buy today. I'm talking about the food you're going to buy today. I'm talking about the gadgets that you might be buying today. You're probably going to buy something, right? We're encouraged to do that on a regular basis in American society. We're encouraged to buy stuff. There's so much advertising going around telling us about really cool things to buy. It's almost unavoidable. The temptation is so great. And so why is that? Well, a lot of it has to do with the media business. A lot of it has to do with the advertising that we see in our, in our daily lives. And so that's what we're taking on today. We're taking on chapter three. We're talking about the media business. It's all about which companies are reaching into your pocket every single day by getting you to purchase stuff. In many cases that you don't need, you don't have to have it, but you want to have it, right? And that's a strong desire. So let's talk about this chapter. Let's take it on. The chapter does start out with an interesting discussion about Facebook. You'll learn if you didn't know already that Facebook started out as a messaging service. Mark Zuckerberg, working for his dad's dentist office, wanted to make it easy for patients to know that they could come back to the back room to be worked on without having somebody to go get them. So they started a message service and he turned it into Facebook. And now Facebook is a monster company. It's got close to 3 billion subscribers all over the world. It owns WhatsApp. It's got Facebook Messenger. It's got a lot of things, Facebook, that are driving people, driving people to make purchases. So Facebook is just an example of media businesses in the United States. And media in the United States are, for the most part, businesses. They are private, privately operating, for-profit businesses. And if you say, you're saying to yourself, well, of course, that's the way it is. No, not necessarily. It's not necessarily the way things are when you look across other countries. I'll, I'll be elaborating on that uh, throughout the chapter. So at any rate, most media companies, they are big companies. And that's what we're going to be studying as a theme today. The, the concentration, the increasing concentration of the ownership of media properties into fewer and fewer hands, fewer and fewer people. That's what we refer to as concentration. And most of you don't even know who the really big companies are out that are out there probably when you're watching media content because that's not that important. Do you, do you know, for example, that if you're watching ESPN, you're really watching Disney? Yeah, Disney owns ESPN. Did you know that when you're watching Hulu? You're also watching Disney. Did, did you know? We don't think along those lines. We just think in the sort of what's in front of us for the most cases. So we're going to expose some of the big media businesses. We call them global media conglomerates. There are some really big ones, Disney being one of them, global media conglomerates. And that's the parent company, right? We don't, we don't really see the parent company. It's like Alphabet is the parent company of Google, right? We don't think about Alphabet. It's a hidden entity. And it's more important that the branding of the individual subsidiaries, the individual companies like ESPN, like ABC, both of which are owned by, by Disney, that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's how media companies present themselves to the public. So let's move on now. That was a long intro, but we got a lot to cover today. So let's move on to talking now about the tradition of private ownership in the United States, which is to say that from the very early beginnings of the United States, 1640s, 1640s before we were even a country, you start to have media being privately owned. One of the very first privately owned media companies was the Cambridge Press. Cambridge Press in 1638, putting out religious texts, putting out the whole book of Psalms. That's W-H-O-L-E and Psalms is P-S-A-L-M-S. -S. So it was a for-profit religious newspaper basically and it was, it was making money. And so you have other examples coming along as well. You have Public Occurrences is a, another name of a magazine slash newspaper. Public Occurrences. That's the name of it with a P-U-B-L-I-C-K. I've got links for both of those in today's email. And in fact, for most of the links in the email today, I'm not going to point out each individual link. You can kind of follow along and open up the links that are illustrating what I'm trying to illustrate about the media business as we cover them. Ben Franklin. We know about Ben Franklin as a famous inventor who supposedly captured electricity by sailing a kite in a rainstorm and it, it struck the key, right? But he also was one of the very first media entrepreneurs. He was a media mogul. He was a, actually a very 
a wealthy and ruthless business person in media. For example, he had a position as Postmaster General in the United States, and he blocked all other newspapers from being distributed by the U.S. Post Postal Service, except for his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, one of the very first profit-making newspapers. So he was a, an early example of a privately owned company's owner making a lot of money on the media. Now, in the early going, in early colonial America, we're going to be getting more into discussing history of colonial America when we talk about newspapers and books and magazines coming up in later chapters. But in the early part, I just want to mention that the early newspapers that were produced in New England, they're not like what we envision today. They were very expensive and they were not general interest. In order for you to afford a newspaper, you had to be a wealthy person. And that's not everybody, and you had to be able to read as well. So newspapers were very expensive, kind of like an iPhone is to a lot of people today. It's very expensive until the penny press came along with industrialization. There's that term again. The use of factories to produce newspapers drove down the costs to a penny, one penny. And, and that's when advertising started to get involved because since a newspaper was so cheap, in colonial America, one penny, anybody could afford one. So now it opens up the newspaper to the general public. And now advertisers are saying, hmm, this is a great way to get to people. We can advertise in newspapers. So we have a big shift in newspapers over towards advertising. Again, profit-making, privately owned businesses. That's, that's what media companies are in the United States. Same with electronic media. Most, if you turn on your TV, if you look at the web, turn on your radio, same thing. Almost everything that you're seeing is for profit. There's there's no public service search engine out there, for example. It's only Google or Bing or Safari. There's no public service. All profit-making media. Let's move on now to the concept of the growth of national news. The growth of national news magazines. Magazines are credited for giving us the first dose of U.S national culture. Magazines are said to do that. Prior to magazines, people would read newspapers from their own town, their own city. The information was just about where they live. Magazines started to produce content like Good Housekeeping or like People's Magazine. You know those two magazines, right? It's our content for everybody in the nation. You see those same magazines at every CVS or, or whatever drugstore you check out of. And that's that's what magazines were doing in the early part of American history as well, as they were giving a Pennsylvanian something to have in common with a Texan, with a Californian, because they were reading about national stories, not about local stories. But even though magazines got the national culture going, it was really TV networks that made us a nation. Made us not Pennsylvanians, not Marylandians. I'm not sure how you say people from Maryland, but not people from individual states that start to think of ourselves as Americans. It was the National Network News that started to do that, which probably has very little or no place in your lives, your own lives because of your demographic. But for many people, the 6.30 evening news, that's where you saw what it meant to be American. And going along with that, in 1968, you have the establishment of the Public Service Broadcasting Network, or Public Broadcasting Service Network. Got those letters flipped there. PBS. And that's the TV side. PBS, you know, um, Sesame Street, for example. And then you have the radio side, which is NPR, National Public Radio. So that was established also um, as part of the landscape of America, showing that we're not completely 100% profit-making when it comes to media business, because those media programs are funded by tax dollars, and they're not running advertising. But they also contributed to bringing about a national audience. And CNN helped to usher the national audience along even further by giving us television content that's news oriented all day long from all over the United States. All right, so let's move on to some of these big companies now, get across the big global media conglomerates that are out there. We are going to start with the world's most famous media company. That would be Disney. Disney, Disney is also a legacy media company. It's not a newer media company like Google or Alphabet. Disney started out primarily as a content producing company, producing company. It started out with Mickey Mouse. You can see a, a link there of Mickey Mouse in my email. 1928, Disney started producing Mickey Mouse cartoons, and then the whole empire really got built on Mickey Mouse. Later came along Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and then, and then films like Gone with the Wind, the film about the Civil War. And then Disney branched out and did something different from other media companies. They opened a theme park. 
in the 1950s in California. That would be Disneyland. And then later on, these theme parks are all over the world. The Disney Worlds are in Florida. They're in China. They're in Hong Kong. There's one in France. So we have a good look at a global media conglomerate that has multiple media properties. And they're intertwined, right? If you go to Disneyland, you see, or Disney World, you see giant Mickey Mouse walking around, which reinforces the cartoon. You see all the Disney characters walking around, which are in the media, and it produces a desire to go see them in films and see them on reruns on television. Disney also expanded. It purchased Touchstone Pictures. That was a film division. And it's produced very famous films all along the way. Pretty Women was a film that was sort of a breakthrough film for them in the 1980s. If you go to Disneyland, I know I just left the subject of Disneyland. Disney World, I should say, in France, you can even get wine at those Disneys. So Disney is mostly a content company. Uh, later on, it purchased Pixar, the animation firm. And it produced Toy Story. Frozen came out not too long ago. And it started to get into animated films, it started to increase its presence in Europe with Disney Paris and Japan with Tokyo Disneyland. Disney also branched out into Marvel Entertainment with Iron Man and the Avengers. And then it, Disney has its own merchandising arm too. It has, you know, for example, you can get Cinderella Makeup. Cinderella Makeup by Estee Lauder, a famous uh, beauty firm. So uh, Disney is, is a force to be reckoned with. Now let's go on to the next company we're going to talk about. A company you probably don't know about that much. It's called the News Corporation. The News Corporation. In 2013, the News Corporation broke into two parts. It broke into the News Corporation, which is one part, and it broke into 20th century, sorry, 21st century Fox. 21st Century Fox, whereas the News Corporation is the newspaper empire that it has, which consists of the Wall Street Journal, the major major financial newspaper in the country. It consists of, of information services as well that it provides, of the, the ticker tape information services about the stock market, for example, and also focuses on book publishing. That's all within the News Corporation side of this News Corporation global media conglomerate. And then the 21st Century Fox, they have the cable division, they have the broadcast division, they have the film division, they have the pay TV division, and they have the satellite division. This company was started by an Australian. His name was Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch married to Jerry Hall, the former wife of Mick Jagger in the Rolling Stones. Rupert Murdoch came to the United States to take out citizenship to start the Fox News Network. He came here, you have to be a citizen in the U.S. to own a TV network. He came here, got a citizenship, and then started purchasing some old TV stations in cities and formed them into the Fox network. But he started out with a newspaper business in Australia. His newspaper was called The Australian. The Australian in 1964, and then he started buying newspapers all over the world. So his biggest brand is the Fox cable network and FX is also part of that empire as well. And we know that in this particular case, this particular company does have a conservative leaning, a conservative, some would say bias, a conservative orientation when it comes to politics on Fox News that distinguishes it from a Disney company or some of the other companies that we're going to talk about. But by the way, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's conservative in every country. If you look at the Sun newspaper in the UK, the largest selling newspaper, it's a very liberal newspaper. You have really raunchy sex advice in there, for example. It's, it's a Fox property. It's a news corporation property, I should say. So it really depends on the individual market as to what the content is it's going to be covered. Also part of the uh, news corporation empire, you have the National Geographic. National Geographic, famous online publishing, best photos in the world, best photographers, supposedly and the Wall Street Journal, which I've already mentioned. Let's move on to, now to another company, Warner Media, W-A-R-N-E-R, -E Warner Media. It was just bought by AT&T, the cell phone company, in 2018, about three years ago. Uh, Time Warner, as it used to be known, used to be the biggest global media conglomerate, but it had a big nosedive. Time Warner was mostly a cable distribution firm. They owned cable companies across the U.S., like Blue Ridge Communication here or Comcast. That's what... Time Warner was, but then they got into film, they got into producing TV, they got into to publishing, they got into online content, um, they, they purchased a lot of car uh, cartoon characters like Scooby-Doo, for example, they purchased uh, Harry Potter, 
uh, the Justice League, that's a Warner Media company, but AT&T purchased it in 2018 because AT&T wants to stream content on its cell phone network. If you're an AT&T holder, uh, cell phone uh, uh, owner, then you might already be accessing Warner Media on your phone. Uh, Ted, this company was largely started by a person named Henry Luce. Henry Luce, L-U-C-E. Henry Luce was a, a his parents were missionaries in China, and uh, so he grew up in 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 the early part in China, and then he came back to the United States and he started a bunch of magazines that are still around today that are really famous. The biggest one was Time Magazine. Time Magazine he started in 1922, and then he went on to find, found Fortune Magazine, as in the Fortune 500. And then he went on to found Life Magazine, which went away for a while and then came back. And then HBO. Yeah, it was all founded um, through Henry Luce's efforts. And then later on, Time Warner, as it was known at that time, purchased CNN. They purchased the CNN network. And that includes WTBS, includes TNT, Turner Classic Movies, and also the Cartoon Network was picked up when you picked up Turner. And also... You have Warner Media used to previously be in a merger with AOL. AOL was the original online service. It's not around anymore except as a messenger service, but you could also find that as part of the, the Warner Empire. Today, there's more than 90 magazines that are published by Warner, and they got 45 websites out there providing media content. Let's move on now to the next company, another company you may not know about. It's actually a, a very strange company. People describe it as more like a couple who are in a relationship who have been breaking up and getting back together their whole lives. You can decide for yourself. The name of the company is called Viacom, V-I-A-C-O-M slash CBS, Viacom CBS. And it's a really strange situation because CBS is a legacy media company. It's the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was started as a cigar radio network. Uh, William Paley owned a cigar business. He wanted to advertise those cigars. Again, media are private profit-making business in the U.S. So he, he bought a bunch of radio stations and formed them into the Columbia Broadcasting System so he could advertise his cigars. But soon he found out that you could provide a lot of other media content on a radio network. And then eventually CBS became a television network when television was, was started and CBS wanted to start its own production studio. So it founded a subsidiary company called Viacom. But Viacom grew so big as a production company, as a film and TV production company within CBS. That Viacom, get this, bought CBS. So they say that the child bought the parent in some way. So I don't really know if the metaphor of a couple getting back together and breaking up can really fit. Later on, they split up. But when they split up, they kept the same board of directors, the same people on both board of directors. It's a very strange relationship. And now, 2019, they're back together again. Woohoo! The romance is back on. CBS has got a lot of properties. It's got the Paramount Movie Studio. It's got numerous cable channels like Comedy Central, BET, the Black Entertainment Network, MTV, Nickelodeon. That's, that's all the CBS, Viacom, Viacom, CBS empire. This company was also very famous for the, the indecency debate that took place in the United States where there was a Super Bowl. You had Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson, and it was clearly choreographed. At the end, Justin Timberlake pulled away her dress and exposed her breast on live television on the Super Bowl. And then there were all these complaints, and then the FCC fined all of the CBS radio stations. It became a big topic of discussion is what constitutes obscene. Does a person's body part constitute something obscene? We have a whole discussion coming up on that when we talk about obscenity later on in the class. But Viacom today still is the dominant force in music videos and MTV and VH1. That's that's Viacom. Now let's go on to a company that most certainly you probably do not know about. It's a German company called Bertelsmann. Bertelsmann, it's today it's the largest, the world's largest publisher of English language books and also music scores, music sheets, the things that musicians play instruments when they read. So this is the Bertelsmann Company. It started out as a Christian music and prayer um, book company in Germany, but today it's expanded into those other publishing areas that I mentioned, as well as newspapers, magazines, and the internet. Also Bertelsmann, interesting backstory here, owns a television channel in the UK called Channel 5. And that channel is where the, the show Pop Idol 
was rolled out. Pop Idol was rolled out on Channel 5, a Bertelsen company. And then Fox over here in the U.S. said, that's a great idea over here in the U.S. We're going to publish that. We're going to call it the American Idol. We're going to run that show over here. That all started with the, the Bertelsmann company. Bertelsmann is really big in Europe and in broadcasting. They, they, and, and in Europe, right, you have so many countries that are close together. It's very easy to get to many different dense uh, dense populations, populations with a lot of people living in big cities. And so Bertelsmann has multiple TV production companies throughout Europe. All right, now let's go on to what we consider to be newer players in the big business of media. Newer players are more recent companies, are not legacy companies, so to speak, although we find some combos of newer companies and legacy companies. This one is a great example, Comcast slash NBC Universal, Comcast, NBC Universal, a Philadelphia-based company, Comcast is, even though it actually started in the Midwest, but it very quickly moved to Philadelphia, and it started out as a cable distribution service, it started out just as a way to get programming to people's houses, that's what Comcast was, but it all changed in 2009 when Comcast bought a majority stake in NBC, actually the company's called NBC slash Universal, NBC, a legacy media company, right? The National Broadcasting Company. That was a that was mostly purchased, um, a majority stock ownership, by by Comcast, and that made it a big player, burst onto the scene, because it's got all the the NBC holdings. And NBC was previously purchased by a French water company named Vivendi, which then purpose purchased the Universal Studios in the United States, and then purchased NBC. It, this is what it's like in the media business. You constantly find new arrangements, new alliances, companies getting sold off. And, and NBC used to be owned by General Electric, GE, the same company that makes your refrigerator and washer and finances cars. They owned NBC as well for a while. And, and NBC used to own RCA, or sorry, RCA used to own NBC, RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. You may still have an RCA TV in your house because they went on to make TVs. And this is a company that has a really long history, even though it's sort of, sort of a newer company. Today, some of the media, media holdings by this company include Telemundo, which is the, uh, the most important Spanish language network in the United States coming out of New York City, Telemundo. It's got Bravo, uh, the cable channel. It's got U the USA network. It's got the weather channel, right? You're checking the weather on your phone. That's a great example. Comcast is reaching into your pocket every day when you're checking the weather app on your phone. I'll explain why in a few moments. And also Comcast owns parts of the Philadelphia 76ers and parts of the Flyers. And by the way, that wasn't new as an idea of a media company owning sports teams. If we go back to CNN, the owner there was Ted Turner, and he purchased the Atlanta Hawks and the Atlanta Braves, and that was part of the programming that was offered on the early WTBS networks. Anyway, I skipped backwards there a little bit. Uh, so let's go on now to, and also, by the way, before we leave uh, Comcast, Comcast also owns uh, the, the venue where the Flyers, uh, the Flyers play, the Comcast, uh, Comcast venue, used for concerts as well. All right, let's go on to the next company. It's going to be the Alphabet slash Google company. It's uh, actually the largest media company in the world. And many of you will think of this company as a search engine, but it's not. It's not a search engine. Google and Facebook and Amazon and all social media, they make money off of what is known as prosumption. Prosumption. You won't find this material talked about in the chapter, by the way. Prosumption is where a person online is both a consumer and a producer. They're both a consumer and a producer. They are a prosumer. And that means that they're looking at other people's posts, looking at other people's photos, looking at other people's shares and likes. But at the same time, with every keystroke, they are supplying information that becomes what's known as big data. Big data are collected by the Facebooks and by the Googles of the world, and they sell all of your activities to advertisers seeking to target you. That's why I can go down to Bethlehem and I can go up to the Bethlehem Steelworks and purchase concert tickets. And by the time I'm home, even though I didn't do anything on Facebook, I'm already getting a bunch of ads in my newsfeed for future concerts at the Wind Creek venue for concerts. It's crazy how much big data is being used every single day to make money off of you and to the tune of $160 billion for Google. That's how much Google made off of you with every keystroke. You're working for Google and you're working for free. You're not getting paid at all for this. And that's how Google works. That's how Alphabet, the organizing company, is. So it is a search engine, but really 
Google and Facebook are advertising agencies. That's a better way to think about them. That's what they are. They're advertising agencies. In addition to the Google search engine, which most people use and even use as a verb in their sentence, I'm going to go Google this. That's how common the word is. In addition to those properties, Google also has YouTube. It has the Android operating system that works in mobile phones. It has Google Maps, Google Docs. It has a secretive project called Calico, where they're studying anti-aging research. It has Project Wings, which is using drones to deliver goods. It's got Verily, that's an interesting company, V-E-R-I-L-Y, which is a healthcare and disease prevention research forum. And it's also got driverless cars. This is all part of the Google empire. And Google was started by two classmates at Stanford University, Sergey Brin and, and, and Larry Page. And they just wondered if they could get all of the information off of the World Wide Web and just save it as links so that they could get to the information ever, wherever they wanted. And that helped them come up with all these sales and marketing strategies that they, they use to, to get purchases of advertising time. They're called, the various platforms that they use are PageRank is one of them, and, and AdWords, and AdSense. You can read about those in the book. You, you can Google them if you want and look them up and find out how they work. It's all about getting those links ranked and search engine optimization. That's once you get those links ranked, then the traffic that comes across those links is going to be providing money to Google and also to the advertiser. That's how that system works. And our final company that we're going to talk about today is the Apple company. Apple known mostly as a technology company. Most of you in this class will have an Apple phone, the iPhone. But there's also the iPad and the MacBook and the Apple Watch. This is all part of the Apple technology empire. It's a company founded by Steve Jobs, a visionary businessman. Didn't finish college, actually. And he was forced out of his own company, Apple. They kicked him out in 1985. And so he went and founded another company called the NEXT company, Next Company, which built uh, a Unix-based computer. Unix is a software code that's used in computers. And he used that, and the Unix helped to inform how the World Wide Web was developing. So he got very much into the technology of developing the web. And actually, his company became so big that Apple bought Next. They bought Next, and they brought Steve Jobs back as their CEO. And then Next Software became the basis of iOS in Apple. The iOS operating software comes from Steve Jobs' efforts at Next. In, 19, in 2001, that was a big year. That's when Apple introduced the iPod. It was a playback device that could allow you to digitally store your music and listen to it. And that was a really big thing. And later on, iTunes software came out. And probably many of you have songs from iTunes. Later, Jobs bought Pixar. Remember, Pixar was purchased by Disney. And he turned into the leading animation studio, and then it got bought by Disney in 2006. So Jobs suddenly became one of Disney's biggest stockholders. The pace of media businesses and interplay amongst human beings is just dizzying, is it not? But you know how dominant Apple is. Most of you have an iPhone that says it right there. All right, let's go on now to discuss our final concept for today, which is the idea of a short head versus a long tail. A short head versus a long tail depicted in the link that I sent, and this is really a business model for how media businesses make money. And most media businesses, they want to live in the region called the short head. That's what they want. They want the short head versus the long tail. So if you look at a graph like this, okay, if you have high sales, your graph is up here, high sales, and that is the short head. And then as sales start to wane, the product's not as popular, they're still selling, then it becomes the long tail. So when you have sh the short head, you're having a high volume of a sale of a media product that is very, very popular. Any Marvel film that comes out is gonna exist in that region of the short head because there's high demand for it. But a Michael Jackson song, a Michael Jackson song's still gonna be very popular. I mean, he is after all MJ, but the purchases of Michael Jackson songs are not of the volume if you will have people purchasing movie tickets to see the Avengers because Michael Jackson has long since passed away and his music is his legacy music now and so some companies still exist in the long tail they sell those niche products they do pay-per-view films on television they offer Netflix series that you purchase through your monthly subscription that just a few people are watching compared to the universe of people out there available to watch like a Super Bowl or an Olympics where you get those really big audiences and and that explains the model that most people, they want to be 
in that short head range, but they will take the long tail as far as making money. Uh, the companies that are really good at, at helping with the long tail include YouTube. It's a video sharing service and it can keep um, products alive from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on. I mean, Britney Spears is in the news. She's you know, a mature and, and returning adult performer, if you want to look at her that way. And, and YouTube is helping to extend that through commentary about her and her father, etc. This is all part of the long tail. So that's going to wrap up our class today on the media business. And my question to you as we finish out is, who is reaching in to your pocket? Have a great day.